Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I think we have some people still trickling in, but I'll go ahead with the intro because we have a, a, a packed conversation and I want to make sure that we get into everything. Um, thanks for joining us for today's webinar, Affordable Housing as a Driver of Economic Mobility, Tools for Counties and Cities. I'm Tim Shaw. I'll be your moderator for the day, and I'm the Associate Director of Policy at the Aspen Institute's Financial Security Program. Um, the overall objective for today is to explore the role of housing affordability as a driver of economic mobility and so showcase some local policy solutions that cities and counties are utilizing uh, in support of their communities. Uh, as part of the webinar, we'll be featuring an overview presentation of the issue of housing affordability and instability coming out of the research um, that we've done at the Aspen Financial Security Program. Uh, uh, it will include uh, a a forthcoming tool that we developed uh, in partnership with Brookings Metro and the National Association of Counties, um, as well as some local government examples from uh, Christy Mahaney, the Executive Director of the Erie County Land Bank, um, and Amy Turham, the Real Estate Development Services Manager for the City of Milwaukee. After that, we'll have a Q&A with everyone, so please stay on until then. I wanted to let you know that this is a third in a webinar in an ongoing e-learning series on economic recovery for local governments, which is a collaborative partnership between the National Association of Counties and the National League of Cities. So stay tuned from both, for more from both NACO and NLC over the coming months. And you can take a look at other upcoming webinars anytime at NACO.org. Next slide, please. Um, a few housekeeping items. Um, today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available online uh, at maco.org slash webinars. Um, and I know we're in webinar season and you all have done a ton of these, but a quick reminder uh, for those of you who might not know that the bottom of your screen is a Q&A box for questions. Please do uh, ask us questions and keep them coming through the webinar. We're going to have that Q&A at the end, but I am going to keep track of those questions uh, to ask when we get there. So ask them when you have them and we'll get to them all at the end. Um, and if you have any technical difficulties, please reach out um, as the, the slide said. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. So again, as I, I mentioned during the agenda, I want to start with situating housing security, financial security, and economic mobility together to get us ready for the conversation about particular solutions that counties and cities might have. Again, this is, I've, been, I've been honored to be able to support NACO for years in their economic mobility and economic recovery work, both in this current role at Aspen and also prior at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Um, and this fits into a series of work that NACO and NLC are doing. Next is we'll be introducing a tool that will be going live on the NACO website early next year, but that we released a report on last week. Um, that'll provide some local data on housing solutions, as well as an outline of policies um, that will allow you to tailor solutions to the housing market of your local community that we're very excited about. And then counties and cities in action, our case studies from Erie and Milwaukee, and then we'll have our Q&A at the end. Next slide, please. Some very short background on the Aspen Financial Security Program. We've actually come to this issue from a long history of looking at policy issues from the perspective of the household budget. We, don't tr we try not to see these policy issues as stagnant, um, single issue policies that only affect, say, the affordability of housing, but rather see these issues as connected over the swath of someone's financial life. Um, we started our work in retirement security, and it became clear to us we couldn't just look at people's retirement outcomes, but looked at income volatility and how that affects your ability to save. And then it became clear to us that income volatility wasn't enough, that debt had a big impact on whether people were able to save and, uh, and have stable incomes and stable financial lives. And then after that long period on consumer debt, it became clear that housing was a driver of all of these things. And so we've come to this after a deep look at all these different parts of the household balance sheet from income to assets to debt. And the place we try to situate our analysis first is focusing on the people whose lives are impacted by housing inaffordability and insecurity. And a co core piece of our analysis was asking people who had experienced those issues, what would happen if your housing challenges were solved? And this slide kind of summarizes the survey we had done with people who had um, experienced that insecurity and unaffordability. 
far and away, obviously you see up top, is that people's mental health, their stress levels would be solved if you're able to solve their housing challenges. But as you look down the responses, you can see um, that it, it really does impact all of the aspects of their financial life, whether or not they're able to save uh, for retirement or for emergencies, whether or not they feel like they have, can have job security because their housing impacts whether or not they can make it to work, whether or not they can build wealth in the, in, uh, in the long term and have secure retirement or pass something down to their children. And that's how people feel about the issue. And it's important to raise that up, that this is part of uh, people's individual lives. Next slide, please. That, that analysis that's embedded in the, uh, a people-centric analysis of how people experience housing and affordability and insecurity levels up to the national level data and the research we know about housing as well. Um, and it became clear as we did the survey of all this research that affordable, stable housing really is a foundation for economic mobility. Um, we have talked uh, as part of our uh, economic mobility work and our webinars and our research over time, what are the drivers uh, of the, the ability of people to really get ahead, to, to take that next step from the place they were born and, and take that next step uh, up when it comes to their place in the economic ladder. Um, and it's things like whether or not you get a good education and can develop skills. Well, housing from, from our research um, is linked to improved academic performance, improved attendance, and the reduced need for school-based social services. For the family, um, what does it take to be able to have the mental space to look for that next job or to be able to weather that storm of uh, a car being, tire being blown out and not being able to take a risk to get a better, maybe better paying job because you have bills to pay? Well, having stable housing helps people pay the bills on time, helps them save and invest for the future, and gives a place where children can thrive. You can see where this is going. It trickles down through communities, through the healthcare system, through businesses who are able to recruit uh, talent, uh, improve their employees' financial wellness. And for governments like those of you who are on the phone, reduces the reliance on assistance and creates a, a stronger tax base. So that's why we're talking about this today, right? Is that these things really are, and, and the ability to solve for affordability and housing st stability is a foundation for economic mobility. Next slide, please. So taking that perspective of the ways that it benefits folks, we wanted to have a good analysis of what the challenges were that we are seeing when it comes to housing. What are the reasons that so many people can't afford housing and so many people are in unstable housing like at risk of eviction? We came up with four core, di core, core, four core corners of the housing crisis diagnosis. The first is that there isn't enough new housing to meet demand. We did an analysis of where housing is growing next to where jobs are being created, you know, people moving across the country uh, to try to get the jobs that will get them further up the economic ladder. And particularly in those places where there's the most job growth, there is the least affordable housing. So that is true in many of the job centers and in many places around the country. The second is that many families can't afford the housing options available to them. Um, and this is true even in places that are more, more affordable. There just is a gap between the wages people are paid and the median rent and the market rent that people need to pay to, to have a home. Uh, and people need help. Many people, particularly low-income people, need help closing the gap. The third is that discrimination continues to harm people of color. There's obviously been a long analysis um, of the way that his housing policy historically has been uh, specifically designed to discriminate against people of color. In many places, in many ways, these harms continue to exist, but you can't look at the disparate outcomes when it comes to housing um, and not acknowledge those things and, and try to take them head on. And the fourth is that current policy disadvantages renters. That there is, this isn't to say that renters should have the preponderance of power when it comes to the renter-landlord relationship, but that further balancing needs to be done. In the vast majority of markets across the country, renters have a, a policy disadvantage when it comes to housing stability. Next slide, please. So from that problem diagnosis, for folks like yourself who are looking at what can I do to address these challenges, 
He came up with five principles for effective, equitable, and sustainable solutions. Addressing housing discrimination and promoting integration, making it easier to build all kinds of housing, particularly in those places where there's a lot of unaffordability and you have growing population, preserving private and subsidized lower cost housing, supporting households directly to close that gap we were talking about between uh, wages, particularly for low income households and the rent they need to pay and supporting renters well-being and access to resources. These are the five key design principles that we have uh, in the chat. You just saw a longer report that has a lot more solutions available to you, in particular, uh, a whole section for local solutions to housing uh, that I'd love for you to check out. Uh, but I'm not going to do a deep dive into those today because I think uh, we have an, a new tool that I want to present to you, and I think we're at an, uh, a particular moment that's worth reflecting on. All of these things and all these challenges that I've talked to you, uh, talked to you about so far predated the pandemic. Uh, cost burden, our eviction crisis, those things happened before COVID-19, but obviously the pandemic intensified all of those things. We issued a report halfway through the pandemic that 30 to 40 million people were at, this, at risk of eviction if the federal government didn't act. Uh, and although there was support that came in from the federal government, now that the savings from checks that have been sent out are starting to dissipate, as well as the unemployment insurance that was boosted through the pandemic, we're starting to see the, the backlog of evictions that we were worried about through the pandemic start to crop up in lots of localities across the country. The second is, and you all are aware of this, that a lot of funding was um, put into place to support localities like yourselves to do more to support people who had gone through um, a tough time related to the pandemic uh, through ARPA uh, and other measures. And so in response to that, uh, we with, uh, the, with Brookings Metro and the National Association of Counties have pulled together a new diagnostic tool to help folks make some of those decisions and guide uh, the, the best use of their, of their dollars when it comes to housing. Next slide, please. So last week, uh, we released a report on the Brookings Metro website that we'll be putting in the chat shortly. Again, developed in partnership with Brookings and NACO um, that will provide county level data about the key stats that you need to understand about your community's housing situation in order to assess the types of solutions that are on the table. Uh, folks like myself who are in the weeds of housing policy often have a laundry list of things you can do that I know gets overwhelming and it's hard to know, well, <clears throat> San Francisco and New York and the bigger places in the country are always kind of at the top of the list when we talk about housing, but that's not what my county looks like or my city looks like. I have particular needs. Are those solutions the right things for me? And that's the kind of thing that we wanna identify in this tool to provide concise, accessible snapshots of data about a uh, county housing market provide each county in the context relative to its state or metro area, and suggest a broad outline of policy solutions uh, and, and places to go deeper if any of those solutions appeal to you. Next slide, please. So today I wanna to go over a little bit of uh, what the tool will present. Uh, the, core, the core of the tool comes from this chart, which is mapping um, your county's uh, housing expenses relative to its uh, population change. And the expenses is the um, median metro area income relative to the uh, county housing value, uh, the, the county housing value, which shows um, through through research um, exactly how unaffordable most housing is in the county. And so, to the right is high cost, and to the uh, going up is a growing um, growing population. Next slide, please. And so we put all counties, uh, all metro area counties on this map and put them into a series of categories. The kind of stereotypical examples that you hear in the media a lot are the New York's and the San Francisco's are in the top right. They're growing uh, and they're expensive. Uh, those are the red and orange counties. But there are also some in the blue area that might have stagnant or, or are losing population and are somewhat more affordable. There are a lot of counties in that situation as well um, that need to think about their housing markets and what solutions in particular are relevant to them. And part of what I'm excited about today's conversation um, is that Erie and Milwaukee fall into that category and they have particular types of solutions and work that they're doing that speak to that segment of um, the, the 
of housing leaders who aren't often covered in the national media. And so for each of these types, growing, affordable and growing, uh, affordable and losing population, growing and losing population, which is a small but interesting group of counties, um, that we have tailored solutions and a tailored outline of, of places to go and a strategy uh, for each type of county. And so that, that's the, broadly what we're looking for. And now I wanna dig into what you'll get out of the tool when it's live on the website. Next slide, please. First example is um, from Milwaukee. And so that previous slide, you saw all counties. Uh, one version of what you'll get in this tool is where you sit relative to the other counties in your metro area. As you can see here is that Milwaukee is on the not, uh, kind of stable in terms of population, not growing too much, but affordable. But most of its neighbors are in the expensive and growing category. And so the, their neighbors in part are having uh, an, an impact on their residents by having a, a tight housing market that's too expensive for most people. And you can, as you're working with other jurisdictions near yours, you can, you can figure out where you sit relative to them and, and situate your solutions relative to the other folks you might be working with. And this will look different depending on um, what, where you are in the country. And so we want to provide that tailored information. Next slide. <clears throat> we'll then go into a deep dive of the particular, um, the particular data from the county that drives the solutions we're going to come to. The, and, and highlighted in red here is what I have is the, are the things that will drive those solutions. The first is, as I mentioned, population growth. The second is median home value to metra median income. Uh, and the, as the data show over four is where you get um, a particularly expensive and crowded out housing. Another piece that will drive basically all housing solutions across the tool is severely cost burden renters. I had mentioned this before um, that regardless of where, almost regardless of where you are in the country, housing is not affordable to a, a large segment of the population. And so this stat is about what percentage of renters in your county um, are severely cost burdened. That is, they spend more than 50% of their income um, on gross rent. And even in a place like Milwaukee, which is largely affordable according to the data, 25% of, um, of renters are severely cost burdened. And so there is still that gap or, uh, that exists between uh, people's ability to pay and the rent they have to pay. Uh, the housing quality also has a series of metrics. And for Milwaukee in particular, I wanted to highlight homes built before 1940. Um, that's a really high percentage of places, which indicates that you'll need to, to focus on rehabilitation and making sure that housing stock is of quality. And that'll take resources. And for places um, that are losing population or might not be growing as fast as they want, that can be difficult to fund. And we're trying to reflect that and the types of solutions that you'll see. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm coming up on time, but I wanted to say, this is the, for, for Erie, it's a slightly different look. Erie is a county that is a one metro area county. Um, and so it will be shown next to all, relative to all the counties in its state rather than its metro area. Again, so you can situate yourself next to some of your comparable counties. Next slide. And, and they'll also have a, a similar table of the, the information uh, so you can see what your information is relative to other counties in your, um, in your state or your metro area. Next slide. And then we'll provide a snapshot. So what is the diagnosis for counties in the blue area? What is the local market conditions? If they're older homes, low values, borderline high vacancy, um, often a reflection of larger economic issues. Some of these can be fixed by housing policy, but also if you're focused on economic development, uh, sometimes that's the right answer. Housing policies alone can't fix all the issues facing folks, but the types of solutions we'll provide are providing subsidies for improving housing quality, acknowledging that state and local governments may need state and federal financial assistance to get that done, which is where ARPA can, can come in, adopt strategies to reduce vacant housing, and excited to hear from our speakers later today about a couple of methods for that, and then across the board, expanding vouchers or income supports for low-income renters because of that prevailing problem of severely cost burden renters. Next slide, please. 
For the, on the flip side, for those of you who might be in higher cost growing counties, um, the core diagnosis is that housing is, is expensive because supply has not kept up with demand. And so solutions would be more like increasing housing supply, make it easier to build small, moderately priced homes, making the development process simpler and shorter, expanding vouchers to low income renters, and potentially uh, add seasonal workforce housing depending on what the seasonal workforce is based on the data. It's important to note across these solutions that for larger counties, these conditions can vary. And so you might have submarkets even in a blue county that look more red, um, that are more restricted and are um, more expensive and vice versa. And so these, these solutions work, but sometimes they may need to be tailored to, to smaller areas depending on the size of your county. And can we skip ahead to the thank you slide because I want to make sure we get to the presentations. So each of those, um, each, each of those examples kind of show what we're trying to do uh, coming up next. And we hope that this tool can be a guide for many counties and other local governments and local leaders in thinking through which is the right solution set for us when it comes to housing solutions. Uh, as this ARPA funding comes in and you're thinking about how to plan for economic recovery with housing as a foundation. Uh, we're looking for feedback. The reason we're doing the soft launch, and we have this report from Brookings, but we're not launching it immediately, is because we want to hear back. Are we, are we suggesting the right solution? Are we at the right level? Does the data actually reflect your county? And so we'll be looking for people who want to get more information about what their county would look like relative to this tool or their community um, and uh, get information from us and uh, give us feedback so that we can have the best tool possible when we launch early next year. So that's where we are, but, but next, I want to make sure um, that we, we get to the, the local conversations because we are, we are national, uh, we have a, a national perspective on this issue, but we're not in the weeds of policy like our upcoming presenters. And so I wanna transition now um, to Christy Mahaney from Erie, the Erie County Land Bank to talk a little bit um, about what she's been up to in Erie. Uh, so, Christy, if you'll turn on your video, um, and I'll let you take it away. Okay. Um, my name is Christy Mahaney, and I am with the Erie County, I'm the Executive Director of the Erie County Land Bank here in Erie, Pennsylvania. Uh, in our county, we actually have two land banks. We have a land bank that operates within the city limits, and then there's the land bank, the Erie County Land Bank, which operates from the city limits all the way out to the edge of the county. We cover about 37 municipalities and 12 different school districts. Um, we are, we're addressing, we're addressing the housing situation. We're actually one of the tools that Erie County is using to address the housing situation. They've really committed to their land bank. They have done something that not many other land banks have. We receive $1 million per year of gaming funds to fund our, our, our programs and our projects. And um, we are also, Erie County also has demolition funds that they're actively using to take down housing. Uh, as Tim pointed out, we are one of those areas that we, we do, we've got excess housing. We, we have too many houses to go around a lot of that. And what happens when that happens is the housing stock goes down, the quality of the housing stock goes down because you end up with vacant, abandoned, deteriorated homes that nobody's taking care of, nobody wants, nobody knows what to do with. Um, that gets very costly for everyone. Even if that's not your house, even if that's not one that you're responsible for, whether you bought it thinking it was going to be a good investment property or whether you inherited it from someone, uh, if it's a house that's vacant, abandoned, deteriorated, it is certainly something that is, that is very costly, not just to you, but to your surrounding neighbors. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, one of the examples that I like to use is actually one of the first houses that we ever took down is in one of our smaller communities in one of our boroughs. It is right in town. It's a it's very well maintained, um, very well maintained middle class neighborhood. Um, it. There's this house that kept circling through the through the tax sales. People would buy it. Uh, some out of town, some in town would buy it, think it was going to be a good investment, thinking that they could put a little bit of money into it, either live there or rent it out. Um, 
as it turns out, once you got into it, the entire basement was caving in on itself. And that was not readily until towards the end, that wasn't readily available, readily viewable from the outside. So this had cycled through every three years or so it had cycled through our tax sale. And that alone is a problem in and of itself. Bigger issue that people don't realize is that that was causing higher insurance rates for all of the houses around it, um, driving up the cost of housing. Also, there was a there was another person on the block who had purchased a house several years ago within the last let's say ten years ago. Person on the block purchased their house let's say approximately ten years ago did some significant improvements to the house, went to refinance their house. And when they went to refinance their house, their new appraised value was lower than what they had purchased it for 10 years ago. And the owner went to the bank and said, how is that possible? The, the um, values have been going up. You know, they've been improving throughout the county. How is that possible that I have bought this house a significant amount of time ago, put some serious improvements into it, not just maintenance, but actual improvements into it. I know it's worth less than what I bought it for. And the banker said, let's check the appraisal, check the appraisal. And they said, oh, here's the issue. The issue is you've got this other property and it's dragging down the value of your house. And so that is where uh, they, they were a big advocate for the land bank coming into that area and getting all of their municipal officials on board. So the land bank came in, acquired the property at the tax sale, tore the property down, and it is actually currently, I don't believe it's been transferred yet, but it is currently under agreement to be transferred to Habitat for Humanity for a habitat build to go on that property. That is the plan for that. So there's a lot of things that, that people don't think of when they think of blighted housing, when they think of the, you know, the vacant, abandoned, the, the excess of housing, those are the types of things that you run into. So we have gotten to the point where we are very much, um, we've got the reactive side of things down as far as we know that we're acquiring the properties, we're removing the worst of the worst, we're tearing them down, either putting them, making them available to be built, a, built on again, or uh, becoming side lots for other people in the neighborhood. Um, and then we are also working on our 2020 focus is what can we do on the proactive side of things? On the proactive side of things where there's been discussion, I can't go into a whole lot of it too much because we're still fleshing a lot of that out, but <coughs> excuse me, there's, um, there's been discussion on, you know, revolving loan funds, on educational seminars, and even something as simple as getting getting a crew in to do cleanups on residential properties that are currently occupied that they've just gotten too far behind on. It, there's there's uh, there's a situation right now that was brought to our attention where there's uh, there's some code enforcement or there's some code issues on a particular property. Code enforcement went to knock on the door. They knocked on the door, and a little old lady on oxygen answered the door barely getting to the door. She's the primary caregiver for her bedridden husband and her yard is so overgrown. It's, it's got the neighbors complaining and, and there's, it's a hazard in multiple ways. So even, even having discussions about what can we do as far as, can we get a crew in there to clean that up? And then, and then local either agencies, volunteer groups, or sometimes even the neighbor could just maintain it and mow it. Um, there are people who are very interested in doing that sort of thing they would love to mow if they if it was a lot that could be mowed. So that's really what we're we're focusing on as a land bank. I don't want to take too much time, um, but I, I think that having a land bank in the in the different areas and really committing and and allowing that land bank to do the things that it that it can uniquely do has been a huge help for the Erie community, and we're seeing it grow. We're seeing we're seeing the need for it, and I really think, um, especially as we move forward, as we see reassessments roll out, as we see values of neighborhoods change, as we see uh, renters, you know, being able to rent quality housing because they're not renting something that was 
bought off the tax sale, a new coat of paint was slapped on and, and uh, now it's being rented out. Uh, all of those things are, are definite improvements for the area. Thank you, Christy. Um, I really loved in our prep calls, your these conversations about the particular story again, because I think it, it brings to life some of the things we were talking about about the basis of um, housing as the, the, the basis for economic mobility and how it really impacts people individual lives. So um, hopefully people will have uh, questions about, about how, to, how to use those tools for their counties uh, and areas going forward. So thank you for that. Um, and so I wanna turn now to Amy Turim from uh, Milwaukee, but uh, real quick, just as a, as a reminder, uh, please do add your questions to the Q&A so that we can have a, a robust question and ses uh, answer session at the end when Amy is done with her presentation. So, Amy, could you turn on your video and take it away? Great. Thank you so much, Tim. I appreciate uh, your introduction and I appreciate being here. Um, my name is Amy Turum. I'm the Real Estate Development Services Manager with the City of Milwaukee. Um, next slide, please. I'd like to give you just a brief, brief overview of the city of Milwaukee. You've heard about the county of Milwaukee, uh, both the same name, so a little bit confusing. You've heard about the county of Milwaukee in Tim's presentation, and the city of Milwaukee is facing a little bit of different circumstances than its surrounding um, suburbs, which I'm sure is familiar to many people on this, on this call. Um, the city of Milwaukee population has um, lost 3% in about the last 10 years, based on the new census, which we're hoping to challenge for federal funding reasons. But um, since 1960, the city of Milwaukee is down about a fifth of its population due to white flight and um, other practices that uh, caused people who, um, and, and excuse me, we have a 25% poverty rate. So all of these uh, policies and practices that Tim was talking about lead to a concentrated population of people who need help. In the grand scheme of things, Milwaukee's rents are very affordable at an average two bedroom being in the $780 range, which I know may blow some people away as being extremely affordable, but it's not affordable to our residents here. And that's what really matters. Although the extreme housing uh, on affordability index that was shown earlier showed that uh, about 25% of Milwaukee County residents can't afford their rent at 30% of their income, 54% of residents of the city of Milwaukee can't afford your, their rent. So um, we've got a lot of work to do and, and we have a, a, re a relatively low area median income and a relatively low owner occupancy and the numbers in owner occupancy have been changing dramatically over the last 10 years. So next slide, please. So, so what are our concerns? Our concerns are the same as every single person on this call. And I understand that their home ownership and increasing homeowners, um, decreasing the number of housing units that are renters. For the renters that we do have, having housing affordability, ensuring that the housing we have is safe, and of course, ensuring that there's adequate wages to support the housing uh, that we do have. So, um, in the city of Milwaukee, 20% of Black or African American families own homes, whereas 56% of whites do. And about half uh, in between those two is, is where our Hispanic um, Milwaukeeans lie. So we have a real disparity in the amount of homeownership. And um, these two pictures here that you're looking at, I'd just like to highlight the one on the, the left is the qualified census tracts in pink. And the one on the right there um, shows our aldermanic districts and loss of population based on the last sentence since. census. So um, what you're looking at here is an area that shows a concentrated loss of, of persons in the dark, dark blue. And that overlaps the main area, the blue and dark blue overlaps the main area where our qualified census tracks are for ARPA funds. So what you're seeing is an opportunity, an opportunity to impact homeownership, housing affordability, housing safety, and wages. So we are at the precipice of a very important time. And I'm glad to share the opportunity that we have in front of us with you today. Next slide, please. So 
we're at the right place in the right time for the city because of the federal funds, but we're also at the right place for the right time because we had a convening of stakeholders that is unprecedented in our city in the last little while. Stakeholders got together that hadn't been in the same room in a very long time. And this was started by something called our Community Development Alliance. The Community Development Alliance was started about 10 years ago by the major foundations in town, um, including private philanthropy and corporate philanthropy, and moved a bunch of ideas forward that were incremental, but in the past year got together and put everyone in the same room. And so what do I mean by everyone? Next slide, please. I mean, everyone. So <laughs> I, I mean bankers, I mean lenders, uh, developers, nonprofits, foundations, people from the neighborhood, people who are living the experience that we're trying to solve for, right? And they all had one goal in mind, and that is to fix housing affordability for Milwaukeeans. So this Community Development Alliance, which started um, with the support of the Common Council and the mayor of Milwaukee, Tom Barrett, kind of directing the entities to get together to stop the silos that we're all familiar with experiencing and get to the root causes. And what did they come up with? They came up with offense and defense for people who can afford middle housing. So they said, let's not talk about people who are earning less than 725 an hour. Those are gonna be people who are gonna be served by our homeless serving uh, organizations or um, other types of organizations through the continuum of care. Let's not talk about people and their housing affordability if they're making $32 an hour or more. Let's get to the middle. So they came up with offense and defense strategies to preserve existing units and create new units. The goals ended up being that we need 32,000 new rental units that are between $400 and $650 a month to serve this gap that's identified on the right, 32,000. And we also need 32,000 new Black and Latinx homeowners to close the racial gap in homeownership in our city. Next slide. So what are we gonna do? Because you can't close that size of a gap without multiple, multiple ideas. So the slide on the left, the portion on the left was come up, was a product of the CDA meetings. Uh, it's a little hard to read, so I typed out in larger letters on the right what the green parts are, what the solutions are. So a lot of these things we're doing already, right? But they need to be expanded because we still have this massive gap between the needs and what's available. In particular, things that have been successful recently has been our down payment assistance program, which has provided up to $9,000 to individuals who wanna buy any type of home, not just a city owned home. But other things on this list are really complicated in Milwaukee and the state of Wisconsin, including reducing the property tax burden because there's a preemption to um, changing anyone's property tax rate through a uniformity clause. So some of you can change your taxation rates for low-income homeowners. We cannot, so we have to work within that rubric. So these are the types of things that we're expanding and doing now, and um, I'd love to answer more questions about them individually, but I'd like to move on to the next slide and talk about where we are with the implementation of this plan that the Community Development Alliance put together. So we're at the very start, um, the very, very start, but we have had the first tranche of our ARPA funds uh, allocated towards particular causes by the Common Council of the City of Milwaukee. Our process was for the Common Council, uh, the mayor suggested ideas and the Common Council suggested ideas and ultimately the Common Council voted on those ideas and a lot of them overlapped. So we've got uh, housing is the, the primary goal. The CDA plan is informing the choices that were made, but the CDA plan is a separate document that's not adopted by the city. So what are we doing? Let's go to the next slide. We're doing that homeowner and renter offense and defense through various programs listed here. One I'd like to highlight extremely briefly is our in-rem tax foreclosure initiative. You just heard um, about how a land bank uses their properties and just, um, 
helps better the neighborhood through the ownership of properties, the city of Milwaukee is its own land bank. We foreclose on properties directly uh, and we get free and clear title when we do so. And that's part of our state law um, that allows us to do that as a city of the first class. So that's phenomenal. We cross the hurdle that a land bank has to go through in order to get clean title very, very easily. So our plan is to take the 600 homes and 150 commercial structures that we have and close that gap. Next slide, please. And one of the ways we're gonna do that is through expanding an existing initiative called the Milwaukee Employment uh, Renovation Initiative and turn it into an in-ground initiative. So what you're looking at is a before and after picture of an average house. The house before picture is actually a lot nicer than most of them uh, and in your average interior picture. What we did with this program is we provided subsidy to private developers who applied to us to become developers um, to renovate homes for home ownership or for rental purposes. And what we did is we subsidized not only the actual physical cost of materials, but we also subsidized labor for people who are unemployed or underemployed um, and that qualified for our residence preference program as a city. So we were able to take our homes and turn them into a workforce initiative and that was so successful that the Common Council would like us to look at another 150 homes with $100,000 worth of subsidy, which means we're gonna be able to do those homes finally that have the foundation issues and have the um, extreme need for demolition. We're gonna be able to rehab those with this type of money. And one of the ways we're gonna do that, um, next slide please is by growing our use of emerging developers. The city of Milwaukee is fortunate enough to have a LISC, the Local Initiative Support Coalition, sponsor a program called ACRE, which it stands for Associates in Commercial Real Estate. Um, they should be putting a link for that in your chat. And what that does is develop um, developers of color over a course of 12 months by providing them access to various um, existing developers um, through giving them an education in development and exposing them to people that they'd never be exposed to otherwise and getting their development career off the ground. My commissioner in my department is a graduate. Some of our politicians are graduates and um, many of my coworkers are graduates. Our uh, housing and economic development agency manager is also a graduate and he is going to be appointed to a position by the Biden administration. So um, this is a program that creates wealth within communities of color by building housing also within communities of color. And it's been phenomenal. Um, it, it was a partnership with our local universities. So I think it would be something that you might wanna ask your local list about. Um, as far as, uh, I believe I have one, one more, uh, two more slides. Let me get through those real quickly if you can go to the next slide. Um, one of the problems we're running into or questions that we have, I call them preliminary discussion areas instead of problems or challenges, um, is going to be potentially using these ARPA funds to backfill these existing city programs. Existing city programs were funded by tax levy dollars, which meant there's flexibility in how we administer the program. We can administer the program citywide. You saw the map before that showed the qualified census tracts. That's only a portion of our city, much like your qualified census tracts are only probably a portion of your areas too. So if we're backfilling our city programs with ARPA dollars, we're gonna to have to change construction standards and renovation standards. Whereas before we asked for just code compliance, now we're going to need federal renovation standards to be implemented. We're gonna need the staff to implement them. We didn't do certain reporting, including reporting on race and other demographic data that's going to be required by the federal government. So we have a lot of questions. And one of the things that um, we're possibly looking to do is take advantage of a new program that's gonna be offered by the National League of Cities, which is an ARPA grant navigation program that's going to be available for cities in the Midwest. Um, we're also having a challenge of having been um, fully allocated for our first tranche of, of, of funds. So we have these other projects that didn't go get funded in that last round. 
And now we're waiting to see what the process is going to be internally in the city of Milwaukee to get funds to these extremely important other projects and ideas that we want to um, bring to life. So I know that's kind of a lot. I know I probably talked a little fast because of the short time amount, but um, next slide, please. I really appreciate everybody joining me um, and joining us today. And I think this is a really great opportunity to discuss some of what we're starting to do. And I'm looking forward to answering any questions if they come up. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. Sorry, I was having trouble coming off mute there. Um, Katie, if we could pull down the slides and then I could ask uh, uh, the panelists to turn both of their uh, cameras back on. We'd love to, to take questions. I have some of my own. And as a reminder, please use the Q&A function or the chat uh, to ask further questions of the group. Um, so uh, a couple that we got here. Um, one, Christy, I'll turn it to you first. Um, someone was saying there are residents in East Tampa and Florida, and the community has shown interest in land banking, but are unaware on how or how to start or build mm -hmm. partnerships, and wanted to ask advice on how to how to educate locally. Uh, well, I'll try to keep it short because I could talk land banking for hours. Uh, to me, it's a no-brainer. So I would say the best thing that you can do is do pull some numbers, do some research, but pull some numbers because the, 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 it's almost like the money speaks for itself. When people realize how costly it is to have vacant, abandoned, deteriorated houses in their neighborhoods, to have it in their tax base, they think that they're getting taxes on, you know, X number of houses at X number of rate. Well, there's a, there's a ton of ghost inventory out there that nobody's paying any taxes on. Um, it's, it's, it's just, there, the numbers really do speak for themselves. If you look at how costly it is, it's kind of like when you go back into the, how costly is it to house someone who's homeless versus have them be homeless on the street and then pay for all of the medical and everything else. When you actually look at the numbers, it speaks for itself. So my advice would be pull those numbers and see, just see how costly those things actually are. We can hook you up with some resources. Center for Community Progress is excellent. Um, you know, you, your local community may have those numbers already. And then I would also look at the success stories. There's a lot of, we're actually a fairly new land bank. We've only been around since really 2018-ish. Um, there are some phenomenal things that other land banks are doing. There's phenomenal things that we're trying to do and that we're in the process of doing, but there's amazing things that land banks that have been established are doing. I would pull some of those as examples because once you realize the partnerships that can be made, land banks are kind of their, their own unique animal, but the, the whole goal is to make those partnerships and to, to capitalize on things that you might not be able to otherwise. And then the third thing would be the funding of it. Make sure you can secure some funding for it because that seems to be that seems to be the biggest issue. I would say is people think land banks are a great idea and then they try to figure out how they're going to pay for them afterwards. Start that early uh, and hit it as heavy as you can. And what are some of the models beyond the ones that you all use for funding land banks, so they can have an idea of of where to start looking? I'm sorry. Uh, where, where are some good funding sources for them to think about as they're, as they're starting to have these conversations? So that's a good question. And I don't think anybody's really figured that part out yet. That's the, mm. that's the issue. So we, we get a million dollars in gaming funds per year, which makes me very unpopular when you're talking to other land banks because they don't want to hear it. They're trying to figure out how to, so there's grants that, that have been applied. That it's kind of scrounging together the funding for it. So if there is something that you can tap into, if there is legislation that you can tap into, if there is demolition funds that you can tap into or get created, um, demolition funds have been huge for us just because there are such a large number of homes that do need to come down. Demolition funds have been huge for us. There's land banks that have charged membership fees. Um, again, we're, we're in a position where we don't have to do that. And it's a good thing that we don't have to do that because our 
a lot of our communities that could really use us could not necessarily afford the membership fee of you know, five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars in order to join. So there are there are different things that different land banks are doing. Again, I would I would seek out something, some sort of sustainable funding. Even if it's just demolition funds that are that are added to each property transfer or whatever it may be for Florida, those rules may be completely different than ours, but just any kind of sustainable funding is, is going to be key. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I saw um, a question in the chat about difficult development areas and using ARPA funding. Um, uh, the National League of Cities has some resources on those areas uh, here uh, that I've just put into the chat, but I'll also flag um, that uh, I was told by NACO that if you have very detailed legal questions about what can or can't be used, feel free to reach out to NACO um, and they can provide a link uh, uh, forward you to their government affairs department. And that, that team might not be happy that I just said that, but uh, please do reach out if you have those detailed questions. Uh, I'm going to turn to Amy first. Uh, you can probably answer this question fairly quickly uh, uh, in the chat about where you, for your housing rehabilitation program, were you re required to pay Davis-Bacon or prevailing wages uh, and monitor this to this function on the labor for the rehab projects? That's a great question. Um, we have a city living wage that's been established that is now um, over $11.50, but not quite $12. And we paid that wage under the program that we were using with city tax levy dollars. Is that going to need to change if we change our program design to do some of that work with uh, ARPA funds? That is one of the questions that we have, and we might be very careful mm -hmm. about how we design our program to get the maximum number of people to work um, with those funds and maybe consider whether we have to, if we do program design in a certain way, whether we can um, stick with the city's wage as opposed to Davis Bacon wages. Yeah. You know, we you had you had talked about kind of the list of things that might be different between the way you have run your programs historically and what you might have to do with new federal funds. Do you have any advice for other um, city officials who might be navigating that same challenge? That same challenge to to think through um, how to best deal with those kind of conflicting uh, processes and standards. That's a good question. Um, you know, I guess I would start with saying don't pen, your, pen, pen yourself into any particular program if you can avoid it until the full guidance is out. So we're still waiting for some guidance from the treasury about reporting requirements, yet we have all of our funds delineated as to what they may be spent on. So that doesn't really give us room to flex uh, or change course once we learn that something might be not possible. So if I was still at the outset of designing my programs, I would try to keep the use of the dollars as flexible as possible with as few program rules proscribed for you, be that from your common council or your mayor or whomever's or your, city, or your uh, county uh, board, uh, whoever's in charge of that, if you can keep it as flexible as possible is to give time for the, the treasury guidance to come out, I think that would be great. And um, I think to uh, relying on tools like the National League of Cities, I've, I know I haven't started the Great Lakes um, pilot program yet with them, but I have taken part in some of their other um, technical assistance, et cetera, programs. And they're very thorough and they can do a lot of the legwork for you. So if that's available in your area, I would contemplate taking advantage of that. Great, thank you. Um, Christy, I, I wanted to hear, we, we had talked a little bit on our prep call about the interest in the um, rapid, the rapid research and the, the helping of folks. I want you to, could you, would you talk a little bit about how others have reacted once you have started to put that program and others out and, and, and the excitement you can build around these programs? Yeah, sure. So the how I how I approach most of these, um, there's an there's a nonprofit that I chair, and I and and I always joke that the woman who runs it, her the most frequently phrased, the most frequent phrase out of her mouth is, "What do you need? What do you need? What do you need? What do you need?" So I. I, I don't know whether I unconsciously or consciously, I try to approach all of my municipalities that way. Like, hey, tell me your problems. What do you need? 
And, and even when I was trying to get, that kind of goes back to the first question that we were answering is how do you get people on board is I led with, all right, tell me, tell me about the houses. What are your biggest headaches? Um, and so when we were starting to discuss for 2022, when we were starting to discuss, we said, hey, we have this, we've got money that we can spend. We were realizing how much we're spending it on the reactive side of things, you know, the renovations, the demolitions what can we do on the proactive side to prevent these houses from getting this way in the first place? And so I just started having these conversations of what do you need? What do you need? What's your, what are your, where's your headache? And it started out in a different direction. Like it started out talking about revolving loan funds and different things like that. And then it, they were just kind of sitting there and, and out of one particular person's mouth came, you know, what would be great? is if we could just help, and that's when that story was told about the little lady who was answering the door with the oxygen. And, and she, he's like, if we can just get them, because code enforcement does not want to ticket them. Like, that's not, that's not going to solve the problem. There's no way she's going to get out and trim eight foot high bushes. It's just not going to happen. So he's like, you know what would be great? is if we could just get somebody out there to get the yard cleaned up. And he, then he, it's like, it kind of snowballed. Once you thought about that one, then next thing you know, it's like, and that one over there. And actually this one over here would be great too. They've got a lot of trash in it and just needs to be cleaned up. If they could just get reset, if they could just get reset back to normal. It'd be great. So I take, I took that and I'm like, I never would have thought about it. It's not, it's not sexy. You know what I mean? It's not like, oh, we're going to spend, it's like a couple hundred bucks, a couple thousand dollars, take down a tree, haul out some trash, get a dumpster in there. It is not fancy, but it is incredibly practical. And that is really what we were looking for for 2022 is what's incredibly practical. So then I started talking with um, some other municipal officials where I was like, hey, I had this idea come across. And every single one of them was like, do you know how great that would be? Do you know how excited my code enforcement officials would be? You know how much we could we could get there's a church across the street that would love to mow for them. There's a there's a neighbor that would gladly mow. Their yard goes up together. We could get we could get our um, you know, our city officials or we could get public works out there. To, there's different things that, that could be done, but unanimously everyone turned around that I've talked to so far said yes. I mean obviously you couldn't use it for everything, but just turning around and saying, What do you need? Where's your headache? How can I help? What do you, what would really help you right at this moment has been huge. I know we only have a couple minutes, but Amy, I'm curious for the Community Development Alliance, when you were gathering all those people together to kind of coalesce behind that, what was your pitch there or, or the city's pitch? How did you get people at the table for that kind of initiative too? Is it, is it similar? Like, what do you need or, or what do you, what do you need to bring people to the table? Honestly, um, you know, the city of Milwaukee was the subject of the book Evicted, which I'm sure many of you have read, yeah. um, which highlighted some of our housing problems on a national scale. There have been groups surrounding rental housing and homeowner occupied housing and housing affordability that has been large, massive groups that have been convening since that time just because they want to, just because they care. And so honestly, it's because it's such a prevalent problem and something that people truly care about. Um, I would like to add something maybe on my last answer about uh, issues. I, I would encourage to uh, intergovernmental cooperation. Um, our county went through an entirely different process um, for their allocation of ARPA funds than we did. And we've been having some very fruitful discussions with them about how our goals align and how we might be able to build capacity within each other. So since everyone here is probably city or county folks, think about your, your neighbors and how, how you can work together. You are, you are singing our tune and that's the exact right place to end this joint webinar between uh, NACO and NLC. Really appreciate Amy and Christy, you for your time today um, and presenting this for the group. If you have any questions about uh, NACO or the NLC's work on these issues, please reach out to Katie and Courtney respectively, so you can find their contact information there. And also reach out to me. Uh, my email will be in the slides if you have, if you have questions or uh, want to engage on the tool that we will be releasing with NACO. We would love to hear from you. Um, these slides and the recording of this will be available after the webinar if you want to send it to folks. And thank you all so much for coming. Uh, have a great rest of your day.